Today we are happy to present Adam Ritchie from Massey Entertainment. Uh, as an audio professional for 13 years, he spends his days producing voices for enormous games. He will guide us through the steps to give your game character a voice. Welcome Adam, so nice to have you. Hello, uh, lovely to be here. Um, so yes, thank you very much Rosanna, Patrick and the team uh and nikki at the great journey and bjorn today as well for this invitation um yeah it's a pleasure to be here and speak to you uh, yeah this is um uh, this is give your character a voice um so i'm aiming this talk at uh, interested gamers um indie developers or students uh, it's not going to be a very technical audio talk because there's a lot of really great resources out there already uh, about sound production but where i mention videos or talks that you might be interested in, then I'll include some links later that we can share. Uh, it's a big topic um, and we'll go fairly shallow, but I'll try and give you lots of food for thought. Uh, and if there's any problem with my microphone or something, then just someone please let me know. Um, so how do we give our characters a voice? Uh, and by voice, I'm talking audio, not just writing, um, and I'm making a few assumptions here with this talk. Uh, I'm assuming that you want to tell a story for your project with voices and that you are going to spend some time, money, or possibly both to that end. And you're also not necessarily an audio professional yet, uh, or you might just be interested, but that's also fine. Um, I want to tell you that making voices for games is really fun. And for me, it's possibly the best, most fun part about making games. Um, so I aim here to help you to better understand what the process of what goes into making voices for games um, and give you some ideas for your next project. Uh, we're going to look at uh, voice design as a job, um, character design, the road to the recording studio, uh, a little bit of housekeeping to keep you organized, um, and then I will be answering your questions. So first, I will introduce myself. Um, Adam Ritchie. Uh, I'm a senior voice designer at Massive Entertainment. Uh, it's a Ubisoft studio. And um, here are some other places I've worked uh, across my career. A um, little bit of brief background. Um, I've always been a, a gamer my whole life. But uh, when I was growing up, we didn't really have many computers in the house until I got a little bit older. So I'd spend a lot of time at my friends' houses who, who had you know, Nintendos and consoles and things. And then I would go home and um, play music or uh, read um, a lot of like offline things. So I had a nice balance. And then eventually, uh, you know, we, we started to get some games consoles of our own. Started with a Game Boy and um, eventually a Sega Mega Drive. And then my parents got Mac computers, which didn't have many games back then. But, um, you know, I, I developed a, a passion and an interest to this stuff, as well as music and film and, and other things that were kind of interesting to me. Uh, when it came to education, I studied music, music technology at Lancaster in, in England. Um, and uh, that was a nice combination of music, computers, the kind of two things I was interested in. Uh, but after I graduated, I didn't really know what I wanted to do. So I just uh, went out looking and um, I, I realized, oh, somebody must be doing the sound for these games that I really enjoy. So why not look into that? And I just did tons of research, uh, ate up everything I could to find uh, a way in and um, got my first job as a QA tester at Midway Studios Newcastle. Um, just a foot in the door kind of job, but then quite quickly moved into the audio team because they needed a bit of extra help. And I was uh, educated in, in that area. So they um, invited me, I, I leapt at the chance. And that's been the beginning to a, a fruitful career so far. Um, I'm still pretty good at breaking games though, which is a good tester talent. And here are some projects that I've worked on. Uh, first game I worked on was Wheelman at uh, Midway Studios Newcastle, which was this mad driving game set in Barcelona where you play as Vin Diesel, just like wrecking the place. Um, and the first game I recorded dialogue for was actually RuneScape at, at Jagex. Uh, 
Fable Legends at Lionhead Studios. That was my first job exclusively on voice, where I was the dialogue supervisor um, at, at Lionhead, which sadly closed 2016. But then I, I had the opportunity to uh, move to Sweden to be a part of Massive Entertainment, which is uh, what brought me to Malmo. So um, if you want to hear more about the work I've done at Massive, there's a GDC talk that I did called uh, NPC Voice Design in the Division 2. It's, um, it's available on YouTube. Um, I talk in depth about how we produce voices at Massive Entertainment and the tools that we use. Um, there's a good talk about spatial audio as well in Division 2 by my very talented colleagues, Robert Bantin and Simon Kudryavtsev, um, where they discuss real-time acoustic processing, uh, a lot of, as well as talking about how we use procedural generation for the reverbs and echoes and ambient effects in the game. Uh, so if you want to learn more about those, then those are great places to start. But what is voice design? Well, that's a great question, Aaron Keener, antagonist of the division and general naughty man. Thank you for asking. Um, well, here are some of the job titles for voice workers that I've encountered over the years. Uh, voice designer and dialogue designer are by far the most prevalent, but there are even more specialist roles. Uh, some relate to implementation. Uh, there are more about engineering and editorial work and some specialists who just work with actors. Um, it's, a, it's a big discipline and it's growing bigger. So let's call it voice design for now. And what is it? Well, it's a subcategory of game audio. And to be brief, it's a, it's a blend of sound design, narrative, and logistics. It's storytelling uh, in all sizes. It's narrative, dialogue, cinematic realism, or combat, or short interactions, um, even just efforts and ouches. It's creating languages, nonsense with feeling, you know, blips and bloops, uh, simlish. Um, in this way, it really is voice and not just dialogue. Um, sound design, it's uh, technical audio processing, it's creative work, uh, making interesting voices, monster voices, ghosts, or uh, crowds, waller, and, and background. Uh, it, it makes places feel lived in. Gameplay systems as well. This could be conditional playback or uh, repetition control, focused dialogue mixing, uh, just to give the player the essentials. And all of this hiding in plain sight because unnoticed is good when it comes to voices. The player needs immersion and we gain their trust uh, by providing it. So we're going to hear a little bit of voice design. Uh, here's a 20 second clip from Overwatch. You might know it. Uh, sound warning. So this might be loud. Just check on your side. Um, but I, I've got a little exercise for you. I want you to count how many voices you hear, how many voice files or how many voice lines and sounds from voice that you hear in this clip. Here we go. So, oh yeah, I, I forgot to say, I was going to ask if you put put it in the chat, uh, your answers. But yeah, go ahead and drop them in there and we'll, I'll, I'll keep talking about this. Um, there's a lot going on in this clip. Um, and it's all being filtered for the player. So they are just experiencing the important uh, six to eight. Oof. Uh, any better on that? Uh, it's focused for the player. There's, I counted about, yeah, there you go, 15. I, I counted about 20 on the first listen, and I think there's more like 22. Um, it's about one a second for this clip, and it's all crafted for a particular purpose. There's a lot going on, it's a barrage, but um, every single little bit of voice in this clip gives you a piece of information about what's happening in the game. You've got the ultimates, the special abilities, pain, um, melee attacks, uh, taking down an enemy, low health, all of these things give you um, feedback about what's happening in the game. And so you can play it without necessarily 
seeing everything that's happening. Here's another example of a voice design. Uh, yeah, I should I should have mentioned that I'm going to use clips from other games as well as uh, my own. Um, this is a short clip from The Last of Us 2, uh, and I'll just let this play. Left a lot of stuff behind. Here, Ellie is guiding the player, reinforcing the emotion of the, the gameplay, the motivation. She's um, she's basically us thinking out loud. Uh, the, the dialogue in Naughty Dog's game is, is always driving and telling the story and what's she doing, what's she looking for, will she find it, um, is she trying to be quiet? It, all of these things, it's communicating to us. It's uh, um, not too obvious, though. It's not too prescriptive. She lets us figure it out at our own pace, which is a, a really amazing balancing act that they've, they've achieved with this stuff. It's very subtle, and very cinematic. Um, and in The Division 1 and 2, the player is free to go at their own pace through the game and the main campaign. So the majority of our character voices are heard remotely over the radio in concise and to the point uh, messages guiding us onwards. Uh, the enemies antagonize and react to the player. They, they call out to each other, trying to outflank, uh, hurl abuse. The combat's peppered with shouts um, that blend into the environment, giving you a sense of space and urgency. Um, here's a short clip. Frequency relay payload detected. Bingo. That comms module has the transmitter we need to finalize communications with the satellites. Agent, activate the crane sequence, and we're in business. Um, most of our story uh, exposition takes the form of acted cutscenes, uh, collectible audio logs, little radio plays you can pick up and listen to. So the player has complete freedom to play in their own way and engage with that stuff if they choose to. And voices bring things to life. This is my friend Sven's dog. Uh, I think if you look at, at the dog and, and think, you know, what's that dog saying? What's it saying at that point? I can, hear, I can hear that voice there. It's saying, I'm feeling very lazy today and it is too hot. And it, it brings uh, an emotional level to things. Um, Paraphrasing my friend Charles Pateman, we're all unconscious experts in voice because we've been around them for our whole lives. So everyone understands it at some level. Sorry, there's a bit of noise in the background. So I um, hope it's not coming over the microphone. Um, all right, so let's think about how we approach this. What kind of game do we want to make? What, what's our audience expecting? How, uh, how are they going to experience the story? Um, and how is the voice going to be heard? This is all going to determine how you approach your, uh, your game and how you plan and design your dialogue. If you're using dialogue cutscenes like in Baldur's Gate 3, uh, boxes of dialogue on the screen, you could be uh, recording a lot. You could be making a big financial commitment in, the, in an RPG style game where it could grow large. Uh, you could have the opportunity to send, uh, to tell grand stories and explore character development, branching storylines, um, but it makes things really complicated. And you could multiply the content that you're going to need to record by a huge degree. Uh, just to give you some idea, Eurogamer in August 2020 said that Larian were promising 45,980 lines of English dialogue across 596 characters. And that probably runs, my estimates, uh, between 80 and 120 hours of dialogue. By way of contrast, Divinity Original Sin 2, uh, their early access build shipped with uh, 17,600 lines of dialogue. 
at 142 characters. So big AAA games routinely ship with anything from from that, that Divinity Original Sin scale to like uh, Baldur's Gate 3 or above, you know, up to 100,000 lines of dialogue. It's a lot of content. But if it's a story that unfolds as the player reaches an objective or is triggered by their actions, uh, maybe it's, it's more of a narrative adventure. Maybe you just need one actor to tell the story, which gives your recording schedule, uh, makes it simpler with only one actor to book. Um, and in contrast to Baldur's Gate 3, the Stanley Parable probably only has a few hundred voice lines. And that all runs together to about an hour and a half if you play it, uh, all the voice lines in sequence. Let's find the story. Um, and a game like Breath of the Wild does fully voiced animated cutscenes for telling the main story beats, meaning that there's only small amounts of dialogue to actually record. But they also record emotive sounds and responses for their characters for their standard dialogue. So this has reduced the amount of reusable, uh, reduced to a, a small amount of reusable vocals that their characters can use to cover nearly all of their, their dialogue. It doesn't matter what you want to write, you have a sound that goes with it. Uh, you need to work out a system for triggering those based on the lines and which emotions or nuances you want to convey. Um, but uh, it's not the same as a, as a crafted nuanced story performance, but it gives them character. Here's a short clip. It's the old man. And it's also understandable in loads of other languages. So you could record that once and then have that for all of your translated versions of your game. However you decide to play your voices uh, in your game, you're gonna, always going to need to do a few things. Uh, the first is design a character, create a character. When you have an idea of how your story is going to go, uh, a good next step is to make a one pager about each character with some key details. So you've got this to refer back to. Eventually, you're going to show this to an actor, and they'll use this to create your character's voice. Actors love to get the details and the backstory about a character. It helps them make decisions about how they're going to say things, how that character would behave. Some things you might consider including in that sheet. Character name, which is always going to change. So have a developer name, which never changes. That's what you refer to that character as at all times. And then the player facing name is the character name. Don't have to do that, but playing age, that's different to the actual age of the character because you, you could have like a thousand year old deity who has the voice of a 50 or a 60 year old. Uh, physical description, um, artwork, what they look like, cultural, ethnic background, accent mannerisms what's unique about them and what drives them what's their uh, what's their motivation um and artwork even if it's just doodles it can go a long way to establishing character uh, I, i'm lucky because I, I get to work with some fantastically talented artists at massive and other studios i've worked at that produce concept art for all of our characters um, sometimes we can't show that to an actor for some reason um, and in that instance we'll probably just go online and find some reference images to use as a starting point for a conversation about the character. And it's great to show your actors the world so that they can understand uh, where it's set. It, it helps to establish the tone. It puts your words into context. Actors love to see this kind of thing. It gives them imagination fuel. This is from Division 2. As well as uh, characters, you can't really go far without some, some actual dialogue. So there's several ways of approaching this. Uh, when you start to write, you could have the traditional screenplay format uh, like here, or some sort of database, um, or even just an Excel sheet. There's pros and cons to each of these approaches. And you could, you could do both, um, but it's a lot of tracking. So screenplay format, I've heard is, is called passive format as well by some people uh, is widely used for recording sessions 
everywhere. It's information is written like a theatrical script, and the more you put into those scripts, the longer they get. So they can be a little bit cumbersome to read if you put too many details in. It's a standard for film, TV, and games. It's easy to write um, and easy to edit because you can do it in Word or some other document editor. But they can be cumbersome to navigate, and you have to manually organize these scripts. What's uh, where's the scene? Oh, it's page fifty-two. Excel um, is also very useful for game developers because lines usually need quite a lot of context, and that information can be stored alongside instead of in a, a long stream. You can search an Excel sheet as well. Um, you can filter some things you might put in your script. Uh, for example, does this need to be in a particular environment, or how loud should the character be speaking? Uh, what gender are they? Um, what effect processing does the file need later on? Uh, timing, localization languages, microphones, effect processing, like all these things that you might need to think about later on. You can just keep adding more columns and then hide them when you need to produce it or show somebody. Uh, they're the beginnings of a database. They're easy to sort, filter, attach data, as long as it's not printed at least. Um, but on the, on the negatives, Actors aren't always familiar with Excel, and they doesn't necessarily uh, work for them. Uh, and it can be difficult to record flowing narrative or dialogue between characters because um, it's a lot of small individual pieces of information. Um, they're quite well suited to Barks recordings or conditional dialogue where you need all of this extra context. Um, but eventually, maybe you want to build some sort of script database to manage your dialogue. And how do you write for voice? Well, I'm not a writer. Uh, I work with some very good ones, though. Uh, this is Kristen McGorry. She's She and I have worked together on several projects. And here she is with Ma Makewell from Fable Legends, one of her characters. Um, even the best writing needs to be test-driven for a voice recording session, though. And no good script survives the first recording session without some changes. Um, I, don't get, I don't get too involved in the writing process, but uh, when we're preparing for the recording session, I'll bring out all of the fine tooth combs and start to pour over the scripts with the writers. Things that will improve your script before an actor even sees it are proofreading, uh, putting the words into your own mouth and trying them out because they sound very different when they're spoken to on a page. And table reads. Table reads are uh, when you get together and read through your, your script, your words um, together with other people who you, whose opinions you respect and trust or work with or are collaborating with. Um, assuming, assuming it's not just like a screaming match, uh, you know, yelling gunfire and grenade, but uh, at a table read, you need to be open to feedback and changes because it's a collaborative process. Um, you can also record the table reads, put a, a microphone on the table, like a little portable one, cut up the audio afterwards. Uh, you can use that in your game, even try, test it out, see how it flows, um, prototyping. And get quick at prototyping. Make some prototype videos that you could show your actor for context. Uh, you could get a free copy of uh, some video editing software, DaVinci Resolve, you can try for free. Um, there are a lot of cheap um, or free audio recording programs as well. Uh, Reaper is uh, initially free to try. It's very, very powerful. I use that for my work a lot. There's also uh, other options out there. Get a microphone, plug it into your computer, and just start to record yourself. You could even use a headset just to get something in there, scratch pad. Um, get used to the sound of your own voice as well, because it's the quickest tool that you're going to have for making sounds and, and prototyping. Um, you can also use other, other options like text to speech. Uh, to generate thousands of audio files. Uh, it can be fast in the long run, but uh, a bit slow to set up. And it's also difficult to listen to unless you're using a, one of these more advanced paid tools. But the point being, get some of your dialogue into your game, figure out how it's going to play, plug it into your middleware, uh, and just get quicker iterating and, and organizing when it comes to your old files as well, because you're going to need to replace things, get rid of the old ones, and know which ones you're you're using and which ones you want to keep. Um, and even better, sit together with your colleagues or your friends, 
play the thing once you've got that in there. Uh, invent fun and interesting lines that they could say, like, oh, what's this, what's this character saying in this situation? Uh, I think I'm right in saying that in the Uncharted games, the actors would watch the game sometimes um, and improvise fun things to say from the, from the gameplay, which is a great way to get inside the player's head when playing your own game. And review often. Um, if you work on a fixed idea for too long, you can miss a really good opportunity to improve or redesign. Uh, does it work? How does it sound? What could change? Is the timing okay? You know, what can we do? Um, get a second opinion from somebody whose opinion you, you respect or experience you value. Uh, and you might want to change your design as you go, making a character react to the player differently over time, building relationships, all these things tell a story. So with your character and your script, how do you get from there to the recording? So here's a very basic overview of how a project might traditionally go. Uh, so you've got pre-production, development, and then you've got casting where you'll find your actors, you'll go record, and then you'll do some post, um, process that stuff, put it in the game, make it sound okay. Uh, and then there's the iterative steps where you redo that because you, you need to account for those. Um, you might choose something different if you're going to record friends or yourself, you might not have to do all of those steps, but later you might get some funding and change your mind and okay, this is, this is how I want to run. There's also online games that are live and then they have a service model that repeats time and time again for years, uh, basically condensing that whole thing into a few months at a time. Um, Division two is a great example of this. Uh, point being, it's worth getting organized. And this is the kind of thing that you could be doing for a while. And while we're talking about planning, um, let's talk about your budget. Start with the worst case scenario, count everything you might want to record. Um, what, what can you afford? Do you have a, a budget? And then probably double the costs because actually equipment and studio time, editorial, casting, actors, it all costs money. However, if you've got no budget, then it's likely that you'll end up recording yourself or friends with whatever gear you can get your hands on. And that's also fine. A lot of great games have been made that way. Uh, just a quick side note here about working for free. Uh, I would recommend you not to ask actors who are paid normally to work for free or for exposure, because if, if your time is worth something, so should theirs be. And this is how people make their living. Obviously, there are times when somebody will be glad to do some work for free, but just check yourself at the door, keep, keep a moral compass and make sure no one is being exploited. Um, if your project ever later makes money in the future and it's successful, then you owe some of that uh, profit to the people who also contributed. Um, many successful games start out as a passion project. Uh, and sadly, some of them do get into problems like this. Um, I would re recommend, if possible, get a simple signed agreement in place with anyone who works on the project, just to work out a sort of potential profit split or uh, share if the project reaches sale. Uh, a little bit of time and effort looking into that could save you some big problems down the road. And casting, this is a picture from a casting call for cats in Los Angeles in 1961. Um, creative and exciting voices are in large part due to the acting talent. I would, I would say completely, but there's a bit of extra magic we can do. Um, actors are amazing people. I appreciate that those aren't people, those are cats, but actors are amazing people. They're emotionally available. Some of them are trained their whole lives to be able to embody another person, uh, express and experience deep emotions um, in the pursuit of a performance. They're fascinating, highly rewarding people to work with. And most, uh, most big games companies will work with casting agencies or, or casting services to find the actors that they need to save some time and also uh, narrow their searches quicker. 
and this is uh, this is what companies like we do. Um, but it costs, you know, it's uh, part of a, a big budget game production. If you end up looking for your cast yourself, then some things that you can keep in mind just to help you along the process. Keep in mind representation. Our entertainment should reflect the world that we live in. Do your characters do that? Are you able to find actors that can represent the ethnicities and cultures of your characters uh, authentically? Um, if not, are you open to changing your character's background to suit the voices that are available to you? All great options. Um, an actor that's putting on an accent is always going to have to devote some of their attention to maintaining that. Uh, that attention could be spent on the acting and the performance. If you can find somebody who may already have that accent or some interesting flavor to their voice, then they can probably spend more of that time on the performance, uh, more of that attention. But uh, they also will bring their own sort of rhythm and uh, background and maybe even improve the script. Uh, <clears throat> and keep in mind, when it comes to your cast, have an open mind. Uh, if you ask somebody to read your scripts and you don't like the result, well, listen to some of their other stuff. Maybe they did a better performance in another project. They might just need the right direction or the right scenario to produce something amazing. And directing an actor is a talent in itself. Um, and location. Do you need to source local actors? Or could you record remotely? There's uh, even before 2020, Massive, uh, we were recording the majority of our actors remotely, uh, who were recording at studios in the UK or North America, and we were in Sweden. Um, especially over the, the past couple of years, actors increasingly have their own little home studios as well. And so a lot of them can produce and record material directly from home and send them online. At launch, Hades included. Uh, contained about 21,000 voice lines spanning 200,000 recorded words-ish. Zagreus here pictured is the most vociferous character in the game with 8,500 voice lines all to himself, voiced by Darren Korb, who's the composer and sound designer on the game. Um, so Hades by Supergiant was, was developed over a period and the, the acting cast regularly recorded new lines for the project. Uh, and given some of the cast were local, they were able to do these recordings and iterations as the game progressed. Um, and this really shows with their voice design work. The really amazing thing about this game is that you almost don't hear the same dialogue twice. They have huge lists of content for every circumstance and condition. It's a looping game. You play through it repetitively, but you're always given something interesting to listen to. Um, they don't just play the same thing twice and move on. Uh, barring very few minor exceptions, every time you die and are resurrected, sorry, spoilers, uh, for another run, then you hear new lines or the next step in the story. Uh, it must have been quite an undertaking. And here are some examples of how a versatile, good actor can, can bring variety and uh, do different voices and just what a little bit of voice processing can also do to give you that range. Hey there, Zag man. How's it going? Look, you have got to get here with the rest of us already. We've been saving you a spot. Let me see what I can do. Make life a little sweeter for you in the meantime. Ah, uh, a naked attempt to sway me from my convictions. Defend yourself, you blaggard. And may the gods show you some mercy, for I shall not. I've heard about you. Look, I'm not like all the others on Olympus. The power of the hunt helps keep me company, so... Maybe it'll help you, too. Do not despair and hold to your resolve, child. Tell me something. Has the goddess Athena thus been true to her word and her willingness to lend you her support? So with your cast, you go to a recording studio and you will turn up armed with a library of information, possibly printed out, maybe it's in your head, uh, that might be a little bit too much information. Not to say that an actor won't find that information interesting or appreciate it, but people can only absorb things at a certain pace, especially if they then have to make creative decisions based on that. 
recently, what I've been doing is sending more documentation and backstory to actors in advance of a recording session. By being better prepared, this help the, helps the actors prepare as well. Then, at the recording session, we'll usually discuss the script and the game briefly, answer some final questions, move on to finding the character voice, because there's no replacement for just trying things out. Um, the actor during the session will probably only refer to uh, the script, a picture of their character, uh, maybe a little bit of about the motives of what they should be doing. Um, they'll ask a few questions to the writer or maybe the voice director. So you've checked your script over and over. You know how and when every line that you're supposed to play in the game is going to work. You're very prepared. You give your actor the script a week ago. They've had a chance to read it. Um, but the actor only has their own imagination and your word to go on. And here's what they're seeing in the booth. Hey, Dennis, surprise. It's a bit of a stretch of the imagination to imagine where that's taking place. What they don't see is what you imagine. Um, you might have that scene clearly in your head. How far away is Sarah calling from? Is, is it windy? Will she be heard clearly? Or are the words going to be faint and distant, carried on the breeze? Uh, is it critical that we hear this? Or is it just a little bit of flavor from a random person as you walk past? Maybe she's the main character. Maybe you can solve this quickly by showing the actor a picture or, or of the scene, or maybe even a screenshot or a video, if you know what the scale is going to look, uh, look like. How big a role is Sarah there? Is she uh, important? How does she feel about Dennis? Uh, is she just being polite? Does she know him well? Uh, or is she stalking him? You know, that changes the tone of the delivery quite a bit. A little bit of that context can really change a simple line like, hey, Dennis, surprise. <laughs> um, and I joke, but I've recorded things in the past that I've been very happy with, and the actor's been happy with it. We've all gone away from the studio, only to find out that they were supposed to be yelling those lines because there was a helicopter behind them. And how is it working with actors? Well, uh, in the session, as well as the actor, you might have the voice director, uh, who's a specialist working with actors um, who brings the scripts to life. You might have the engineer. Uh, maybe you've got a writer there with, with you as well. Or maybe you are doing two or three or even all of those jobs. Maybe you're the actor. There's a danger that you're going to have to wear too many hats and performing all of those jobs at less than full capacity. So in that case, it's good to share that workload if you can and let you focus on your responsibilities so that you can listen to the performance or uh, make good decisions about uh, the sound and expect things to change. Actors will grow to know your character better than you yourself. Uh, or if you're, you're the one recording it, then you'll, you'll change your opinions about the way that they would act and, and behave. No script is going to say the same, um, and that's a good thing. Be open to new ideas and these happy accidents. Embrace it and let yourself make those mistakes and learn from it. Some of the most interesting performances I've ever recorded have been interesting ad-libs from actors or, oh, hey, what if we do this? And review early. If you're recording for several days, try and get access to the uh, edited material or the recording sessions and, and check your work out. Um, things sound very different after the session than when they did in the studio. All of the context is gone, the thrill of the session's gone, uh, the clock stopped. It, you can now have to imagine how it's going to work in the game. Uh, if you can, test them in the game, or put them straight in, or, or perhaps you can put them over uh, video footage. Um, and then you can go back the next day or the next session and make your adjustments. I wanted to show you quickly uh, what a typical recording setup might look like in a professional voice studio. Um, this video of Greg Riccardi recording a voiceover commercial shows just that. OK, OK, all right, awesome. You're not alone. Mm -hmm. The CDC estimates that in just the United States alone, Almost 30 million people struggle with diabetes. That's almost 9% of the U.S. population. 
I'll just pause him there. Uh, you can see it's a big room. It looks like it's a music studio. They've got guitars and pianos, but this is kind of typical. Um, microphone here as a pop shield to avoid distortion from any plosives of air being blown at it. He's got a paper script uh, on a lectern, but that could also be a screen. Um, and this also could be a smaller booth, much, much smaller. In fact, it could be in his home. Um, and he's wearing headphones. He'll be listening to himself or possibly to the engineer and the director in the other room uh, or the client. And they'll possibly be saying, yep, yeah, that was a good one. Choosing the recorded take, saying this one was the right one. Let's pick, keep that. And then the others will become secondary selects or alts. Or we just throw those away. We just pick the one. Um, and if they decide those things in the recording session, then actually that saves them some time later on. Firewatch, with a game like Firewatch by Camposanto, which, which I love, um, where the game revolves around the character's dialogue with another character over the radio, it's amazing to be able to record those things together rather than separately. So we just saw a, one person in the recording booth. You could have two. They could be separate rooms, separate countries recording remotely. But the context of your surroundings and uh, actions in this game all affect the story and how the actor needs to say those lines. Um, and also how you say those things you choose imply the response. It informs the other actor's decisions. Being organized and having all of this information, you know, oh, Henry just did this and then did this and made this selection, mapping it all out is essential to making the most of that recording session. Um, this scene is a lovely interplay between the two characters. Uh, recording these things in isolation is is possible. Uh, you record one person, you read the other half, and then take those recordings and play them to the other actor. But having both record together, even if it's remote, and able to hear each other and react to their performance is going to give you the most natural chemistry. Here's a short clip. So I have a bit of a confession to make. What is it? Um. I was I was drunk last night when I welcomed you to the job. Yeah, well, you're not the first boss to be guilty of that. I know. I just I know I can get a little pushy, you know, putting you on the spot about uh, why you're out here and stuff. And you thought it was a good idea to get into your um, love life, I guess you'd call it. Yeah. Um. <clears throat> anyway, I'm uh, I'm sorry. It's fine. I'll, I'll, I'll keep that sort of a thing to, uh, to a minimum. Anyway, let me know when you get back to your lookout. I can imagine the first reads of this scene would have been quite different. <laughs> they took a really nice approach to this, this game. They lay the groundwork uh, with the character development and build upon it later. Um, I think I was also quite mean to her <laughs> after her apology. Uh, and then I felt bad about that. Um, there's a great talk called Do You Copy by William Armstrong and Patrick Ewing, who worked on Firewatch's dialogue system that you can watch on online. Uh, they actually released as well the entire dialogue content to the public when after they'd uh, finished their paid localization efforts, um, they did a community translation for extra languages. Uh, so you can actually, if you can work your way around that, that stuff in your tech savvy, look through the, their di dialogue database as well. <clears throat> and uh, you've now recorded your actor and edited your files and put them into your game. Uh, so maybe you need to make some changes. Let's talk a little bit about housekeeping. Naming conventions. When you write a new version or you make changes, how are you going to track those changes? Will you be using source control for your audio files and for your documents? Uh, how are you going to recognize the file that you've recorded versus the ones that you haven't. You're going to have to listen to stuff to experience it because you can't just look through sound files like with images unless you can read waveforms. Uh, there's nothing worse than not being able to find an audio file that you need because it takes time to listen to those. It's not like a picture where you can just see it. Uh, and those files need names. Um, you could use underscores in your file names because Spaces are bad for searching. It's often used as a wildcard. Um, 
maybe you need a lot of information in your in your names you know maybe you need a uh, project the dialogue branch what the character is what kind of processing maybe a unique id to sort of randomly uh, generate something so it's nothing's everything's unique um, but it's nice to have them sort of be at least partly human readable you can go camel case uh, make it shorter which is capitals for each word um, you know maybe maybe simplify it maybe you just need the scene name line number character projection level or you could just go with a random id that you literally just made a tool to manage and you never actually act, touch your files then you end up with something like that which is uh yeah that's something um some things to avoid line one dot wav i've seen that a lot when you use numbers give yourself somewhere to go zero zero one would be better than line one but then what happens if you move line one to line two then you get a new line one do you have a line zero uh, or this is the voice line that they will actually say in this voice line it looks amazing dot mp3 well firstly the text is going to change i mean don't make your your file name the same as that they are saying uh because you might end up with duplicates which one's the right one and and, and why is it an mp3 as well uh, keep your stuff at high quality to start with uh, this yeah okay this kind of works but um it's a bit unfriendly uh there's probably only one person in the world who knows what those things mean and it's an og like seriously it's just stick to wabs um, and the longest file name ever uh firstly there's a thing on windows for certainly for old systems called the file path character limit where you can only have so many so this will cause you problems if it's deep 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 in a folder and uh, why is it a video as well like let's just stick to audio for voices naming ideas for scripts uh if you're looking at script file naming you can have conventions for that too it's very very useful project release date uh, uh, like which version it is the act the scene um which branch or, or scene name iteration this is the camel case version uh, unique ids if you want a friendly name like uh, this is we're going to call this the something script and a number and maybe an approval like okay this is the unapproved version versus the approved version avoid who wrote it what time they wrote it what they had for tea and final version exclamation mark at the end and for characters uh have a convention for them keep it simple uh all the extra information can go on a, another page um keep your developer name that doesn't change or um you know you're going to rename that character five times no, they're still referred to as the something um add some key information if you want like age or uh, what their role is um you could also have the actor in there probably the actor number or id rather than the actor's name because if you change the actor then it's going to be complicated later um probably don't use soldier one soldier one is in every game i've ever worked on i think uh probably every film as well and because it's the first soldier they will end up in every scene as well and you'll just hear that same voice uh, boy is not a good name for a ca well, oh, there's that one time okay but usually it's not a great name for a, a character daughter oh, it's not very descriptive is it like whose daughter is it what purpose does she have it what what if there's another daughter later on um and you know if you're going to go with something a bit more techy then yeah cool that's good for you but maybe avoid the ambiguous characters being next to each other which one is the l and the i in that or the zero and the o so that'll probably bite somebody at some point um this is one of my many desks over the years this was a uh, the green room at shepherd and studios where i was catching up on emails and things uh, between sessions and writing my memoirs here um, on this old windows surface and i would use that little tablet to track wording changes from the recording session and then i would import those back at the office so our subtitles would match what had been recorded um, and about subtitles that's just last thing we'll talk about accessibility what about people without audio we've talked so much about sound or i have at least 
Um, what about people who can't listen to your game? Uh, people who are hard of hearing. There's a lot of gamers like that. People with sleeping kids who just want to have the volume low or off. Um, as, as a developer, as a responsible developer, you need to think about reaching your audience. And whoever they are, they will appreciate you for making they will get your game accessible to them. Um, what if you lost your hearing? Like, how would you enjoy your games? Um, you can do a few things. You can work on subtitles. You can add closed caption descriptions uh, or descriptive text for things that are happening off scene or only audibly. Subtitles for sounds. And visual locators, you can add uh, indicators for where sounds are coming from so that people don't have to use their ears for locating stuff. People will appreciate it. Wrapping up, you can do it. And remember, making voices for games is a lot of fun. And there's nothing like hearing your story come into life through the performance of a talented actor. And some resources for you. I promised this earlier on. Um, <clears throat> I didn't make anything about dialogue databases because I'm not super well versed in what's publicly available at the moment. Uh, but there are a lot of tools out there. There's uh, Scrivener, Final Draft, uh, Microsoft Word, Flowcharts, uh, Unity and Unreal, I think, both have inbuilt dialogue systems and maybe management tools as well. Uh, Wise has got a dialogue management tool. Um, better that you research something and find what works for you. Uh, at the top here, voicedesignresource.com, uh, created by Charles Pateman, a friend and colleague of mine, um, which the voice design community is gradually building uh, to be a place to learn about our craft. Uh, so that's a great place to go if you want to learn more. Um, and all of the things below should be on there probably, but there's my talk about the division two, if you want to go more depth uh, into that project. Uh, realistic performances in games. I mentioned, didn't mention this earlier actually, sorry, but uh, in 2017 GDC sessions, Ryan James from Naughty Dog uh, shared some of his methods that they used to create realistic performances for animated characters in their games. And that's a really fascinating talk. It's not specifically about audio, it's mostly about, uh, uh, you know, animation editing, but it's there's a lot of really useful transferable things in there. Uh, do you copy the Firewatch dialogue talk, Finding Sound for Space by my colleagues, Robert and Simon, uh, the GDC channel, and I should have also had the Great Journeys own YouTube channel down there as well. And thank you for coming to my amazing presentation, final, final, use this one, latest MP5, uh, and listening to me rambling on. I, I hope you got something out of it.